Welcome back to another video. I'm Evan Brand. I'm board certified in holistic nutrition. I'm also a functional nutritional therapy practitioner. I run a lot of lab testing on people to help investigate the root causes of their health issues. I do a lot of stool testing. We do urine mycotoxin testing, organic acid, nutrient profiles. We look at neurotransmitters. We look at Lyme and co-infections like Bartonella and Babesia. And I've been honored to help so many people that have been to 10 or 20 doctors before me, and they're not able to get to the root cause or they're not able to actually do a protocol that gets them better. So on my Instagram page, which I'd love to have you join me there, I asked, what health symptoms can I help you with? And we got hundreds of responses. I don't like doing those little Instagram slide things where you have to click through the story and read people's answers, and it's like this little long thing. That's too much work, and it's just not very helpful. So we're going to do it in this format, and I hope you find it enjoyable. So here's the big list. We're just going to run through as many of these as I can, and I hope you enjoy and you stay focused the whole time. Myocarditis, heart attack after the virus. They did not get the injection. 36, healthy male. Well, that's terrible to hear, but I've interviewed Dr. Pierre Corey. We've done podcasts on this, so look up those episodes. Primarily what we found is IV vitamin C is really helpful. We also talked with Dr. Thomas Levy. We did a whole podcast about that. IV vitamin C seems to calm down the myocarditis immediately. Also, there's some good papers on motherwort. It's one of my favorite herbs. We use that for strengthening the heart, so hope you get better. Reflux after mold exposure. This is very common because mold affects the gut bacteria promoting overgrowth such as H. pylori. So it would be important to do a GI map stool test first. We'll figure out what kind of infections are going on and then we can address those as needed. Could be H. pylori, could be other bugs, but mold weakens the immune system and allows these other pathogens to thrive. Sensory processing dysfunction. So a lot of times this is tied into neuroinflammation, meaning the brain has inflammation due to some pathogen or toxin. This could be related to mold. We've seen it in Lyme. We've seen it in Bartonella, which is a co-infection. It's a bacteria you can get from cats, fleas, mosquitoes, lice, ticks. So to help calm the nervous system, we could do something like the Gupta program meditations and try to calm down the nervous system for sensory processing. Also things like GABA, my GABA chewable supplement would be good to calm the nervous system down. But sensory processing issues are usually toxin related, especially in children, and we've had good success with that. You see flare, two years of blood in the stool. That's terrible, so obviously you need to get the proper help that's very complicated. Ulcerative colitis is no good. We've seen it many, many times on the stool testing. Almost every time there's root causes there. There's parasites, worms, bacteria, some sort of infection driving that. So feel free to reach out to my office, office at evanbrand.com. You can send an email there or go to my evanbrand.com page. You could contact me there. I'll be happy to help, but we got to get that thing calmed down. It's not good. Doesn't sound good at all. Uh, chronic fatigue and detoxing. They don't have energy or they don't have access to a sauna. Yeah, I mean, chronic fatigue is highly linked to mold and Lyme. So I would like to know why does this person have chronic fatigue? What have they done testing-wise? If they haven't had a full workup, that's where we're going to start. And the cool thing is we can do something called mitochondrial biogenesis, meaning we can create new mitochondria by supporting them with specific nutrients. We don't like to push people too fast in the beginning. We need to see what's under the hood first, what kind of infections are there, are the bowels moving, is the liver, the lymph, the adrenals supported, if so, then maybe we can start to push that person out of that chronic fatigue. Histamine intolerance and leaky gut. Yeah, this is a big one, and a lot of people have histamine intolerance due to mold. So mold is going to aggravate the mast cells, M-A-S-T. And mast cells, when they get aggravated, they're going to release more histamine, tryptase, and other inflammatory cytokines. And this is going to raise your histamine bucket to an almost overflowing state. Now, when you go and you eat high histamine foods, such as ground beef, pineapple, avocado, leftovers, that's going to overflow your histamine bucket. And when you have an intestinal permeable barrier that's open like that, that's intestinal permeability, that's leaky gut, undigested food particles get into the bloodstream and drive more issues. So histamine intolerance, leaky gut, they're one and the same. Extreme constant confusion and extreme brain fog. I'd like to know about if they got the injection or not. Did they have the virus? Do they think it's related to that? Have they looked at their timeline to see when did this extreme confusion and brain fog start? Also, sound like a broken record, but it's true. 
Mold causes a lot of brain fog, and most people have had exposure to mold. It's very, very common, especially in modern buildings where we have drywall, we have air conditioning units that can leak, we have condensation in the attics. You know, this is a very common problem. I talk about it like it's this rare thing, but it's not at all. So many people are affected by this. So I'd like to run some labs on this person and see what we can figure out. They also mentioned here eye floaters. So I would say that eye floaters are probably related to toxins. That's another great clue for me. Mold and Lyme both cause vision issues. Years ago, I was looking at a blue sky and I'd see all these little black squiggly things and that was toxins. And when I got better, I no longer have those vision problems. Eight-year-old boy with food selectivity since two and yeast in the stool. So yeah, I mean a lot of kids get picky. It's hard because parents just give in and give them the macaroni or whatever, but ultimately if he has a yeast problem we got to make sure we get the diet dialed in. So on that kid, I would run an oat test. We can start there, probably a stool test as well. Weight loss from mold exposure. Yeah, that happens. I lost about 30 pounds a decade ago. I didn't know what it was. It was probably mold back then as well, but at least my big root causes that I can identify were mold toxicity, but I think even bigger was H. pylori for me because I had a lot of digestive issues and lost weight that way. I had parasites as well. I had crypto and I had giardia. So I think if you're losing weight, yes, it could be mold. It does affect your hormones. There's papers on that. If you Google mold weight loss, you'll find that mold can create what's called anorexogenic changes or ortho orthogenic changes where you either get fat or you get skinny from mold. So I've seen that clinically as well. Question about vetting doctors. Yeah, I mean, really, I'm not a medical doctor, but I have great results with people clinically because I've been through hell and back with my own struggles, and I create a lot of content showing you guys what I do behind the scenes in regards to the lab testing and how we help people in the clinic. So I would just encourage you, if you're vetting a practitioner, look at the reviews. I've got 600-plus five-star clinic reviews from the last decade, and then also I publish content. I show you what I'm doing. I pull back the curtain so there's no surprises, and if you vibe with those people, you vibe with their story. I think that's all that matters. Candida overgrowth. Yeah, super common. I did a podcast with my buddy, Dr. J, yesterday. So check out the podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you listen. We did a whole show about candida and how it could be affecting your brain. So check that one out. SIBO, three years. You still can't shake it. Well, most people that have bacterial overgrowth problems, they have mold or something suppressing their immune system. So if you've been treated for SIBO, you're trying to get your gut better, but you can't that could be related to some underlying toxin. I find in many cases, people that come to me, they say, hey, I've taken this and that for SIBO. My naturopath recommended oregano and clove and berberine and all these things, and they still have dysbiosis. When we run their mold test, they often have either mold colonization, meaning they're growing mold, or they actually are storing mold. They have mycotoxins. So if you have SIBO times three, you still can't shake it. That's where we need to look. Question about strengthening the LES. They're talking about the lower esophageal sphincter, candida, SIBO, reflux, bloating. Well, it sounds like you've already had some labs done, so that's good. You figured out SIBO. You figured out candida. I'd want to know what else is there. Are there parasites? Is there H. pylori that can affect that esoph esophageal lining? I'd like to look there so we could run a stool panel if you'd like. Gut pain, headaches, always feeling full and bloated. So, hmm. Always feeling full and bloated, you know, could be candida, it could be H. pylori, there could be a lot of things there. So once again, we got to test, not guess with her. We got to figure out exactly what she has going on, but I'd say gut pain, feeling full and bloated. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there was H. pylori there. I mean, you got to realize 51% of the world population has this bacteria, but when it overgrows, it becomes a problem. Fatigue and heart PVCs, that's no good. I'd want to know about the injection status, the viral status, what's happening there. We could certainly look into that. Another person here, SIBO, Sears, children, mold detox options, chronic dry cough in children after years of mold exposure. Yeah, so unfortunately, I see a lot of kids that have mold exposure one, two, three years old. We see these kids on paper. You've seen me do case study videos on my Instagram page about them. And yeah, you can end up with SIBO and Sears, that chronic inflammatory uh, syndrome from mold exposure. Now, I think there's overlap between mold and Lyme and co-infections. So this woman here is saying that there's a chronic dry cough. I'd like to look at the oat test, see if there's some colonization going on. Maybe there's some internal fungal problems that we need to address working on the sinuses and working, working on the gut. Dizziness, balance problems, brain fog, fatigue. Yeah, I had all of that. So 
I had mold, I had lime, I had Bartonella, I had Babesia. So those are the places I'm going to look, depending on where you grew up, if you had exposure to a water damaged building, if you had tick bites as a kid, even sexual transmission can happen from male to female. So depending on your history there, depending on mosquito bites, even a pesky little mosquito can transmit Bartonella, which is a bacteria that will cause all this dizziness, balance problems, brain fog, fatigue. It creates inflammation in the brain, the capillaries. So if you have cold hands, cold feet as well, that's another clue. And we can do a urine test to investigate. Eczema. Eczema is often linked to the gut. Surprise, surprise. Everything manifesting on your skin is usually related to what's happening internally in your gut. I've seen literally thousands of cases of skin issues, some in very young children. They get referred to dermatology. They do topical steroids. They do other creams and these magic potions that really are not addressing root cause. So for eczema, we're going to run a stool test. We're going to run urine. With those two labs, we can see exactly what infections are happening. Is it gut inflammation? Is it intestinal bleeding? Is it low pancreatic enzyme function? We can look at fecal fat as well and see how well are you digesting your fats. A lot of people talk about diet and they say, okay, you are what you eat, but really you are what you digest from what you eat, meaning you could have an animal-based diet, you're doing fruits, you're doing rice, you're doing berries, you're doing awesome meats and butter and ghee and coconut oil and all the things, but yet your skin's still messed up. We need to look inside. So you cannot eat your way out of these skin issues in most cases. Wake up with a tight head, not quite a headache, but it dissipates as I move around. So morning stiffness, that's a classic sign of mold toxicity. I'd start with a urine test, look at the mycotoxins in the urine, see what happens. If you're waking up stiff, this could be related to your lymphatic system as well. It could just be chronic inflammation from other things, infections, bacteria. You're going to hear me talk about this a lot, but infections are very common. Eight out of every 10 people that I test show up with something, meaning bacteria, yeast, candida, fungal problems, etc. And those can drive stiffness in all sorts of ways. Brain fog. A lot of people relate to this. Brain fog could be something you experience while you're driving. You go into your pantry. You forget why you're there. You lose your keys. You lose your wallet. Just these silly little things that impair your daily life. You're like, why am I forgetting this? I can't remember my best friend's name. Just silly stuff like that. That is brain fog. Now, it could be to the extreme point where people cannot work. Oftentimes, we're going to look at neurotransmitters. We're going to look on the organic acids test. We're going to look at dopamine. We can look at serotonin as well. Now, if you have low brain chemistry, that's low neurotransmitters neurotransmitter function. And this can happen due to toxins such as heavy metals. We can see that on paper and we can use specific amino acids to elevate and raise the brain chemistry up to where you clear that brain fog. Now, the virus, the injection, there's other factors here when it comes to brain fog. Candida, that creates a toxin called acetaldehyde. That can create a lot of brain fog. So we have to look at mold, candida, heavy metals, gut infections. And once we clear all that and we boost neurotransmitters, boost nutrient levels, people can get rid of their brain fog for good feeling out of body I've experienced that. Some people call that derealization, depersonalization. It's usually tied into a chronic infection like a vector-borne illness like Babesia or Bartonella. It could be Borrelia burgdorferi, that's Lyme. So I'd like to know this person's history with tick bites, mosquito bites, fleas, lice, spiders. Did they ever have pets that had fleas, for example? Feeling out of body is a pretty unique experience tied to these specific infections. So I'd like to look there. We use a urine test for that. So we have people jump in the sauna or we do exercise. We stir up the bugs and then we collect the urine and see what happens. And then depending on what we find, we can use specific herbs to hit those bugs. Tinkling in the temples, vibration sounds in the ears. Hmm. You know, that's a weird one, but I would say we need to run a Lyme and co-infection panel. I had tinnitus years ago. That's the ears ringing. I'd lay in bed at night. I'd hear it. I'd have my head on the pillow. Ring. I'm like, God, this is driving me nuts. And so a lot of times it was tied into the Lyme. Once I used herbs to fix that, I no longer have tinnitus. Knock on wood, my ears don't ring anymore. But I had all kind of weird head sensations. Some say that's tied into Bartonella as well, which is another type of bacteria. Seeing floaters and blurry vision. So we talked about that a little earlier. Another woman reported that. It's usually tied into toxins. If you have vision issues, it's usually a toxin problem. So you may consider doing something like my Detox Pro. That's a binder that can help grab onto toxins. If you notice your vision, your floaters improving with that, then you know you got to keep going. So toxins will affect the optic nerve. You can do something online called a VCS test, and it's a visual contrast sensitivity test. If you fail that test, that's a sign you have biotoxins such as Lyme or mold toxicity. 
Inability to keep ferritin above 20 without supplementing, red meat eaten several times a week. So ferritin is an iron storage protein. It's really important for females to have adequate ferritin, maybe 70 to 90 would be great. This person here saying they can't keep it above 20. So that's not good because you're going to have issues with shortness of breath, probably some hair loss, anxiety as well. So I'd like to look at this person's gut. We can run some labs to investigate, but there's probably infections that's causing that. So if you have parasites, often you're going to have low ferritin. Very foul smelling flatulence after eating. Keep in mind I have celiac disease. Yeah, I mean your gut's messed up. Celiac, yeah, for sure. You're gonna have malabsorption with celiac, but often it could be related to the type of vegetables you're eating too. So if you're doing like sulfur, you're doing like broccoli, those type of things, you're doing FODMAPs like onion or garlic, that could be driving the bad gas as well. So I'd wanna look at your gut. We could do a stool, we could do a urine test, look for different bugs and balances there. But if you have bad gas, that's a clue. I know some people think it's funny, but really it's not that normal to have a lot of gas. I mean, years ago when my gut was messed up, I did, but now, current day hardly ever and so my gut's way way better now and it's much calmer so to me gas is really just a sign and symptom that there's internal dysbiosis there's methane type SIBO or there's other infections in the gut that shouldn't belong five-year-old ASD so they're on the spectrum oral tics muscle twitching at night and poor sleep I'd be happy to do a workup. I work with kids five and under all the time. But when you see ticks, you see muscle twitching, you see poor sleep. Yes, that's all connected to the spectrum. But what is causing the spectrum? There's root causes to that. It could be heavy metals. I'd like to know about the history there. I'd like to know about mold exposure. Where did this kid grow up? What's mom's health look like? What kind of toxins have been transferred from mom to the baby? Those are the questions we must ask because we've seen that microplastics are going through the placenta, fetuses that are not even born yet, they have microplastics and hundreds of chemicals in their body. So it's really, really tough for kids to grow up normal these days. So we have to work on them as young as possible, get them better so they can develop properly. A uh, seven-year-old with chronic hives every single day. Yeah, we got to look. That's a mast cell, maybe a histamine problem. There's probably something in the gut that's affecting the immune system. So if you go to your allergist, maybe they're going to recommend an antihistamine or something for the hives. Maybe that gives you temporary relief for this little one here. But ultimately, we need to look inside and see what's driving that. It's probably a gut problem. We've seen it before with hives, eczema, all sorts of skin and reactivity problems like that. There's probably some level of what's called mast cell activation happening. So we may need to use some antihistamine herbs to quiet this hives reaction. Post-nasal drip. So post-nasal drip is pretty easy, honestly. A lot of times we're just going to do a sinus rinse. We're going to use a xylitol-based sinus rinse to clear that out. Sometimes it's the environment people are exposed to. So if you've had water damage in your building, your school, your office, your home, and you have a post-nasal drip, that's the first place we have to start. I have it right here on my desk. You could burn our Oasis candles. We just sold out of these because I posted this reel on Instagram. They got like 125,000 views overnight. So thank you all for the support, but we click quickly sold out of those. So we'll have a new batch of the candles. Hopefully by the time you're watching this, you can burn those candles, but that will improve the quality of the air that you're breathing. And that could help with the sinus drip. So if you're having sinus issues of any kind, you could start with the candles. You can burn those for two to three hours in each room room that you want to treat and see and let us know how your symptoms improve and then if we need to look deeper into the gut running an oat test to look for internal mold colonization that's what we should do several people writing in about panda so panda stands for pediatric acute neuropsychiatric disorder associated with strep now that's a mouthful but what it means is when you have strep bacteria overgrowing in the gut of a child the immune system can mistakenly target the brain you're going to see sensory issues abnormal behavior maybe they're crying very easily they're just emotionally weepy they're breaking down over the smallest things they could have food restrictions as well so they're becoming very picky with their diet it could be disturbed sleep you could see dark circles under their eyes their skin complex might not look as good. They could have anxiety and depression even at a young age. So that's pandas. And a lot of people are starting to recognize this. Hopefully I'm part of the reason because I'm educating people. I talk about pandas all the time. It's very, very under-recognized in conventional medicine, especially in pediatrics. They just, they don't really acknowledge much of it. But this strep bacteria is extremely common. And we see that strep bacteria grow after children have had antibiotics. So if they've had maybe a dental procedure or ear infection, something like that, they've done antibiotics, the strep starts to grow 
and can mistakenly target that brain tissue causing pandas, what you see as this constellation of symptoms. And so ultimately we use herbs to calm the nervous system down, but we have to work internally on the gut. And this can take years to resolve. In some cases, it's very complex, but I'd look forward to helping you if you're struggling with that. I've had personal experience with it. Infertility. I've done videos on infertility. A lot of people are going to IVF for twenty or thirty thousand dollars, and you're forcing a pregnancy that should not happen. What I mean is, there's underlying chemical toxicity, mold toxicity, or something affecting the male's sperm. Which was another question about that male having zero sperm. So the male, there's issues there with toxicity. There's hormone deficiencies in the female. And this is going to cause infertility and miscarriage, so progesterone being too low. A lot of this is tied into adrenal problems, thyroid issues, Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune low thyroid problem. So infertility is the clue that your body is not right. Unfortunately, I see people push the pregnancy forward with IVF, and there's some issues that happen in the offspring there. So I would encourage you, if you've had infertility, let's take a look. Let's do a good functional medicine workup on you. Let's get stool and urine testing so we can investigate what infections could be robbing you of your nutrition that would feed a baby. We find that when we fix the gut, I've had dozens of dozens of dozens of kids born as a result of using these protocols. In fact, a lot of women send in emails to the office, hey, I actually got pregnant on the protocol, now what? So that's a very, very exciting thing. Internal vibrations, anxiety, dizziness, and brain fog. That all sounds like Bartonella to me. I want to know about your history with mosquitoes, ticks. Did you grow up in the woods? Do you like camping? Do you live somewhere where there's mosquitoes and ticks? Internal vibrations, I had that years ago. You'd be laying in bed and notice it. You'd just be laying there quiet, and then brrr, you just feel this thing like coming down your arm. It could be your back, your head, your neck. It's weird. But the dizziness, the brain fog, that all clues me into this. So I would recommend you reach out. We could do several different labs, but at a minimum, we're going to do a Lyme and co-infection lab because I really suspect Bartonella. So I want to look there, and we can use specific herbs to address that. 10-year-old child with chronic constipation. Yeah, a lot of kids, they have restrictive diets. They're not getting enough vitamin C. The soil quality is so different now that studies have shown that an orange from the year 1920, you have to eat about eight oranges today to get the equivalent nutritional value of an orange from 1920. And so vitamin C helps to move the bowels in these kids. Now, there could be some level of dysbiosis as well, so certain bacteria can slow down motility. What that means is if you have bacterial imbalances, that can be driving the constipation. And so we're going to use a stool test to investigate the bugs. And then short term, we can use our hydration essentials. That is my electrolyte powder, and that has plenty of vitamin C in it. Most of the time, one to two scoops per day, it's going to help people move their bowels. So I would start there. Kids mold toxicity, where to start? It's the same as adults. We get labs to measure the toxicity, and then we create a protocol designed to fix the specific issues. So we'll use certain binders, liver support, adrenal support. Depending on the age of the child, if they can't swallow pills, there's powders we can use, there's liquids, there's chewables. But kids are really no different than adults, and in most cases, we can actually get the kids better faster than the adults. They're younger. They've had the toxins for less less time. And so it's really a wonderful thing. About half my practice is children these days. And I really love helping these kids. It makes me look good because an adult that's been sick for 40 years, they might take two to three years to get better. Whereas a child in six weeks to six months, they can make a complete recovery. So same thing, oat test, myco, GI map, that's where we're going to start with kids. So we talked about pandas earlier. This question ties directly into that. There's a four-year-old with itchy. They're just saying itchy. Four-year-old itchy, hates pants, doesn't sleep. That sounds like an autoimmune or potentially just an inflammatory brain problem. This is a sensory issue. They don't sleep well, so there's probably some inflammation that's suppressing melatonin, and they're saying they're itchy and they hate pants. So if they have sensory issues, they don't like the clothing, that's a symptom, that is a sign of either pans or pandas. And both of these are triggered by similar infections. So bacteria, viruses, and other pathogens can trigger these sensory problems. So if your kid's like, hey, I don't like pants, don't like socks, don't like underwear, don't like tags on my shirts, that's where we're going to look. We're going to look internally to see what's driving this crazy immune system, this crazy brain response to where they're having these sensory overloads. And this could apply to light and sound as well. Okay, last one. I hope you've loved these. There's many, many more, so stay tuned on the Instagram page. 
It's Mr. Like Mr. Evan Brand. You can join me there. I'll try to post one of these every couple of weeks or so. I try to post that little question box about your symptoms, and I try to help as many people as I can. Obviously, this is not a replacement for one-on-one -on -one functional medicine care. So if you need help clinically, my team and I would love to help you. EvanBrand.com has all the information. If you just want to listen more, learn more, the Evan Brand Show podcast has been out for 12 years now. There's over 500 episodes there, just like this, where we're talking with doctors and other practitioners about functional medicine. So I'd love to, the opportunity to help you in that way. Or if you need consultations, you can also reach me at my site, evanbrand.com. And then Better Belly course, I have Long Haul Warriors. That's a injection and virus course. So I have a lot of different programs on my site as well. So I encourage you to scroll through those, look at those, consider enrolling into those where you're going to see case studies, people just like you. You're going to see before and after lab testing, things that I've done to help people to heal their bodies, even if they suffered for a long time. So last question here, 35-year-old female with old looking skin. Well, it is true. Once you hit 30, things do change with your skin. So the collagen is going to start to denature and degrade. And so I see a lot of women in their 30s now doing Botox. It's very scary. I'm seeing a lot of issues with filler. I've seen several different surgeons talk about this online, how it's staying in the body. It's migrating. It's kind of creepy. I don't like it. So Number one, we're going to look at the gut because a lot of women in their 30s, as the stomach acid levels decline with age, they're going to start to pick up infections. That means H. pylori and other bacterial dysbiosis. When you have these bacteria that are overgrowing, you're going to have issues with breaking down your food, getting those proteins converted into amino acids, getting the collagen from your meats, your bone broth, etc. All those nutrients that fuel healthy skin, it depends on a healthy gut microbiome. So the first place, if you have bad or old looking skin for your age, we're going to look internally at the gut. We're also going to run organic acids testing because there we can look at nutrient levels and we can see specifically what are you low in. So vitamin C, it's a pre precursor for collagen. And 99 out of 100 people I test, unless they're supplementing, they are low in vitamin C. So that's a very, very critical cofactor for collagen synthesis. So that's where I'm going to start with you. Look at nutrients in the urine. We're going to look at the stool, and I hope we can make your skin look better. I don't think I'm like a, a beauty model, but my skin is much better now than it was a decade ago. When I had gut infections, I had terrible skin quality, and I'm much, much happier with my skin now. I hardly ever have any breakouts of any kind unless I'm touching my face too much. I'm out in the dirt, out in the sand, rubbing stuff on my face. Sometimes I'll break out that way. But otherwise, if everything's dialed in with the gut and with the nutrition, the skin should look pretty good, at least into your mid-40s. You'll start to have more degradation of the collagen structure there, but there's other things we can do. So we'll save that for a dermatology-specific episode in the future. This is Evan Brand signing out. Look forward to helping you and talking to you again real soon.